Hello, friends, and welcome to episode 675 of the Juice Box Podcast. On today's show, we're going to have a conversation that I didn't think I'd ever have on this podcast. It's with the CEO of a pharmaceutical company whose goal is to make insulin and make it affordably. I know, that's weird, right? Please remember while you're listening that nothing you hear on the Juice Box podcast should be considered advice, medical or otherwise. Always consult a physician before making any changes to your healthcare plan or becoming bold with insulin. If you have type 1 diabetes and are a U.S. resident or are the caregiver of someone with type 1 and a U.S. resident, you are eligible to take the survey at t1dexchange.org forward slash juice box. It's a quick survey. It's not hard. Your answers help people with type 1 diabetes. It also supports the podcast. It's completely HIPAA compliant, absolutely anonymous, simple to do. You really can't go wrong. t1dexchange.org forward slash juice box. This episode of the Juice Box Podcast is sponsored by the Contour Next One Blood Glucose Meter. Learn more about my daughter's blood glucose meter and buy it even if you want at this link. Ready? I'm going to say the link. Contournext.com forward slash juice box. The podcast is also sponsored by U.S. Med. U.S. Med offers white glove treatment to its customers. You can get your free benefits check at usmed.com forward slash juice box or by calling 888-721-1514. Start getting your diabetes supplies from US Med and get rid of the headaches that you have now wherever you currently get your diabetes supplies. My name is Martin Van Trieste. I'm the president and CEO of Civica. Civica is a nonprofit generic pharmaceutical company whose mission is to bring quality medicines that are always available and affordable for everyone. Okay. I want to find out how you got to this. So I'm going to go back pretty far. What did you do in college? So I'm a pharmacist by training. So I, I got a degree in pharmacy from Temple University School of Pharmacy. Um, and as I was graduating pharmacy school, I had a chance to do an internship at Abbott Laboratories in Chicago, and I decided to take that. And ever since then, I've worked in the pharmaceutical industry. Did you go to college with the intention of dispensing pills, or did you think you were always going to go into pharma? No, I went to college thinking I someday would own my own little pharmacy. Really? That's great. That's really interesting. Uh, is there something about it that moved you? Was it just the opportunity and you enjoyed it and just kind of stuck with it? Yeah, I think the first I had the opportunity to go into industry and experience what industry was like when I was an intern. Mm -hmm. I thoroughly enjoyed that. At the, that time, I began to become aware of the little mom and pop pharmacies were closing faster than others were opening. And I said, you know, probably don't want to work for a chain pharmacy yeah. or a hospital. And so I went into industry. I don't want to date you, but about what year was that? So I graduated pharmacy school in 1983. Okay. So you... It's interesting, right? You, you grow up with this idea in your head, and then the landscape shifts right out from under your feet, I guess. Yeah, it's, and, and within a really quick time period. So when I went into pharmacy, there was definitely an opportunity to have a viable pharmacy. And when I came out, that opportunity had been gone. So just five years. Wow, it's fantastic. Change. Yeah, it's really fantastic how quickly it could happen. Okay, so you... Um, uh, what did you do the fir at that first job? Were you in compliance? Were you... Uh, I was in. A, I was a research pharmacist, so I did formulation development. Wow. So I was the one who took the the active ingredient and made it into something that was pharmaceutically elegant that you could actually administer to a patient, <laughs> so they could so it could be effective. Yeah. Did you work on anything that you're particularly proud of? Uh, n not when I was an intern. <laughs> <laughs> You weren't allowed and that close I, to the bench. I guess I guess I have to be careful about that comment. So I met my wife, who was also an intern at Abbott at that same time. So I worked 
on making a family, I guess. Uh, there you go. Yeah. So you're, you're definitely proud of that thing. Now I know my, my wife will tell me all the time, my wife's in drug safety and uh, very interestingly, she went to college to be a doctor. And when she got out, she had a little, a little kind of falling out with her family and she just couldn't afford to apply to med schools. So she got a Kelly services job. They Kelly does scientific stuff too. And uh, she just was really good at the safety stuff and, and stayed with it. And she tells me all the time about uh, her second job out of college was with a very small uh, pharma company called Forest Labs. So she worked on Celexa and, um, and she's, she's really proud of, of what she did with that when she was younger. So that's what made me ask. Um, okay. So do you jump or, I mean, pharma is one of those jump around jobs. Did you bounce around a little bit? Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, what I would have to say is I worked at Abbott for 21 years. Wow. And while I was at Abbott, I did numerous kind of roles. I was a formulation pharmacist. I worked in manufacturing and then I was in quality and I left Abbott as the head of quality for the hospital products division. And what happened is when I was at that point in my career, Abbott had spun off the hospital division to become Hospira. And I said, you know what? I had spent too much time building the organization mm -hmm. that I didn't want to be part of the one that was probably going to tear it down, I you know, as a, as a standalone company. So I left there and I went to Bear Healthcare as their global head of quality for their biologics group mm -hmm. based in Berkeley, California. So from Chicago to Berkeley. And then I moved after two years at, uh, in Berkeley, I went to Amgen in Thousand Oaks, California, where I was their chief quality officer. Wow. You still, you have a little of the, the Chicago in your voice. I do. Still, yeah, yeah. So when you were moving around inside the company like that, was it a case of you getting bored? Was it a case of you wanting to learn more or were people poaching you because they saw your work? Uh, I think it was a combination of my uh, leadership wanted me to be a well-rounded mm -hmm. professional. So Abbott was good at making sure people got exposure to different parts of the company. So when they became an executive, they were well-rounded and understood how the company worked. Right. So it was, it was partly that. It was a little bit partly because, you know, I, 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 I didn't get bored, but I always wanted to do something different. Mm -hmm. I understand at some point you start feeling like you're doing a repetitive job and that feels like it's time to move. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, when I was in eighth grade, my guidance counselor said, you should be an attorney. And I said, but then I'd be an attorney every day for the rest of my life. <laughs> and I just, I couldn't imagine even as a little kid, like doing the same thing over and over again. Anyway. Uh, so what, I guess the question is, is that what did you pick up along the way or see that made you want to make this leap from Amgen to what you're doing now? Well, it's, it's very interesting. So I retired from Amgen. Oh, uh, I retired from Amgen and went into retirement. And one day my phone rang uh, and I typically don't answer my telephone unless I know who it is. And it rang. And I had no idea who it was. It was a, a Utah area code. And for some reason, something said answer this phone call, which is like, I never do that. Mm -hmm. And I answered the phone call and it was a gentleman by the name of Dan Lilliquist, who was a chief strategy officer at Intermountain Healthcare. And he was talking to me about starting a nonprofit pharmaceutical company. And he was telling me about his ideas. And he asked if I would come to a meeting that they were having in Utah, where he's bringing in various advisors to, you know, beat up on his idea to see how it be, how to make it successful. And they were politicians, health system executives, pharma people, academics. So a wide group of people came to this meeting in Utah. Uh, and I had no, no interest in going, mm -hmm. right? But I looked at my wife. I said, we haven't been to Utah, right? Let's go to Utah <laughs> and make, make a vacation out of it. <laughs> And then one thing, you know, led to another, I kept providing advice over some time to them and they got to the point where they were going to announce the official name of the company and the start of the company. Mm -hmm. And he had called me about it and I go, Dan, do you have any employees at the company yet? He goes, no. 
I go, you can't announce a company when there's no one working. <laughs> so he said, well, can you hire some people for me? So I hired the original team at the company. Uh, and then I said, okay, Dan, what are you going to do now? You need a CEO. Someone needs to lead these people. I just hired. And I gave them some names to some people. And they came back and they said, no, none of those. That, that they, they want to do a bigger national search. Mm-hmm. And I said, guys, you're going to delay you know, the start of this company by a year if you do a big national search. I said, you, gotta, you really got to look at these people hard. And um, one thing led to another. Dan called me one day and says, we got the answer. I go, oh, good. Who'd you hire? Because I got to tell the other ones why they didn't get hired. <laughs> He goes, no, we want you to be the CEO. And I said, you know, what, what don't you understand about retirement? I'm happy. <laughs> I'm retired. I'm just dabbling on the edges, helping you. No, no, we want you to be the CEO. And I think I said no on eight consecutive days, multiple times during the day when Dan, he's a very persistent individual. I, I gather. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, finally, my wife tapped me on the shoulder and said, look, you should probably do this job. It's, you know, it's exactly what you've been preparing for your whole life. You know, your, your experience in developing all the drugs that are on, on on the list of drugs we were going to make are on drug shortage. Mm -hmm. And I may, I either formulated them as a pharmacist, I manufactured them or I oversaw the quality of them when I was at Abbott. So, so I said, okay, I'll, I'll do it. I told Dan, I said, I'm going to do this job so you can find my replacement. So I'm only giving you six months to find my replacement. Four years later, I'm still doing the job. <laughs> are you are you pleased about it? Oh, yeah. No, I, I thoroughly, thoroughly uh, love the work. And, you know, it's more of a volunteer assignment for me because I get no compensation from the company. Oh, I no kidding. All pro bono. So it's really... It's really been interesting and fun, and I, I've loved the, the the team we've put together. I mean, how many times in someone's career do you get to hire your entire team yeah. from scratch, right? So it's a great team. It's been a lot of fun, and we've had great success. We've done a lot of great things, and so so yeah, it's been it's been a real pleasure. I interviewed the gentleman that put together the um, the production floor for Omnipod, and his story is so similar to yours. It's fascinating. He was retired from a soda company and, you know, somebody said, Hey, come take a look at what we're doing. You have any thoughts? And then the next thing you know, he's not retired anymore. Um, it, it, but you're not taking a salary. So you were retired and comfortable and, and you're doing this. I mean, okay. I see why you helped in the beginning. And I even see why you took the CEO position. How come you didn't bail on in six months? What kept you there? Hey, how about U.S. Med, the number one distributor for Freestyle Libre systems nationwide, number one specialty distributor for Omnipod Dash, number one fastest growing tandem distributor nationwide, the number one rated distributor in Dexcom customer satisfaction surveys. They have over 1 million diabetes customers served since 1996, and they always provide 90 days worth of supplies and fast free shipping. I don't know what you're waiting for. USMed.com forward slash juice box or call 888-721-1514. Let me say it again. 888-721-1514. US Med takes over 800 private insurances and nationwide Medicare in the United States. They have an A plus rating with the Better Business Bureau and they want you to get better service and better care than you may be getting now when you order your diabetes supplies with your current company. Listen, we're all in the same boat, right? We get our diabetes supplies. Many of us get them from companies, distributors, and uh, let's be honest, those experiences are not often good. But they could be if you go to US Med. USMed.com forward slash juice box or call 888-721-1514. Speaking of diabetes supplies, How about that meter you've got? Is it any good? Is it accurate? Is it costing you more money than it should? You don't know, do you? That's okay. Most of us don't. 
Everybody just sort of takes the meter they're given. But the truth is, you can pick your blood glucose meter. And if you have that option, you might as well use that freedom to get yourself a good meter, a meter that is accurate, the one that my daughter uses, the Contour Next One blood glucose meter. Head over to contournext.com forward slash juice box right now. You can learn more about the meter. You could buy it if you want at that link, uh, read about it, see it. You can't touch it because it's the internet, but it is pretty close. Let me explain to you what it would be like if you're touching it. Meter's small, it's easy to handle, it fits well in your pocket, it fits well in your purse, it fits well in your diabetes kit. The test strips offer second chance testing. So if you should kind of touch the blood but not leave it there long enough or get enough, you know, you can go back and get more without ruining the accuracy of the test or wasting a test strip. Contournext.com forward slash juice box. This is the best meter I've ever used. Easiest to hold. It's the easiest to see at night. The light is bright. The screen is, is, is simple. There's no confusion with the Contour Next One blood glucose meter. You can find links to Contour Next One and US Med, actually all the sponsors, at juiceboxpodcast.com or right there in the show notes of your podcast player. When you click the links, you're supporting the show. They're not a sponsor in the classic sense, but let me take this last little second here of music to tell you. Once again, t1dexchange.org forward slash juice box. U.S. residents who have type 1 or who are the caregivers of someone with type 1 can take a brief survey that will help people living with type 1 diabetes and benefit this podcast. t1dexchange.org forward slash juice box. Click a little bit. Click a little bit of those ads for Sky. Oh, why I didn't balance six months? Um, because there was always another challenge, you know? Mm-hmm. We did we achieved our first big objective, right? And then what's the next objective, right? So there's always a big challenge ahead of us. And at some point, you know, you've got to look at it and say there always will be a challenge, yeah. you know. If you do your job correctly, if you're trying to change the industry and transform and disrupt the way things have been done in front of you, there's always going to be challenges ahead to keep it interesting. That's excellent. So what did you, I mean, what were your first steps? Obviously you set up the company, had you needed employees, uh, but you're, I mean, can you talk a little bit about the difficulties and, and some of the things that came up in that room when people were trying to shoot holes in this idea? Like what, what are the, I guess my question is, is what are the big obstacles into getting into such a, I mean, in, in, into a space that makes a lot of money for the companies that are in there when you're saying we don't, that's not our goal. How do you get into that? How do you not end up in an alley beat up by a, <laughs> you know? You know, a lot of people ask me that question. <laughs> like, are you afraid that someone's going to kill you? <laughs> and I said, you know, the pharmaceutical industry is so used to competition, right? Mm-hmm. And for people to try to do things differently, that it, it doesn't pose a big threat to them. Right, because they, they know there's always going to be someone doing that and they, they prepare for it and they have something new that they're introducing in the marketplace. The other thing is remember, we're working on old generic, very old generic drugs that are on shortage. And by just that definition that they're on shortage is people don't want to make them anymore. Okay. Right. So there's there's limited competition. The drugs are on shortage. So so it, that's part of it. The other part is you know, people took us for granted. They didn't think we could do it. I remember one quote from the CEO of a very large generic company who said to one of our members, the CEO of a large health system, go, you know, you guys don't know how to make drugs. You're not going to be successful. You don't bother me. And I think that was a prevailing thought process when we introduced the company that they thought, you know, a bunch of hospital executives aren't going to know how to make drugs. Mm-hmm. They didn't realize that the hospital executives were really smart and they hired a pharmaceutical executive <laughs> to build a pharmaceutical team who knew how to do it. Hey, 
did you go look at his uh, back catalog of drugs and decide which ones you could make <laughs> just to show no, him? No, we, uh, <laughs> we actually, how we select our drugs is really, really interesting. So Civica is a member driven organization, right? So large health systems are members of the company and they decide what drugs we should make. So they look at their portfolio of where they're having trouble finding a drug. Mm -hmm. And then they look at what is the patient impact for not having that drug. Okay. And they prioritize it together to say, here's what we want you to make. Now, it's a great idea on paper, but when we went to execute it, I thought this was going to be total chaos, right? We had 60 people in a room, hospital, pharmacists, supply chain professionals, nursing nurses in a room to say, we can only do 10 drugs to start in the first year. What 10 do you want us to make? And there are over two, at that time, there were like 280 drugs on the FDA's drug shortage list. Wow. And over half of them were sterile injectable products, where, which is what our focus was on. Mm -hmm. And I thought this was going to be total chaos, right? It was a four-hour meeting. And after the first hour, we had consensus on the first 25 drugs that we should work on. Mm -hmm. And uh, they actually prioritized them, one through 25. So I was pretty impressed because that really showed what was important for the patient. Was right? it to get a bunch of people in a room who would agree on something that quickly says they're really focused on what that patient needs. Yeah. And, and it means they all, they're all seeing the same thing overall. Right. Yep. Yeah. Was insulin on that initial list of 25? Insulin was not on that list of 25, uh, but it was something that people were asking us about because mm. insulin's not, was not on shortage. It was high price, but it wasn't on shortage. Right. So we wanted to focus on the drugs that were on shortage. And I was in the, I was, I really did believe that the marketplace would fix the insulin problem mm -hmm. as generic insulin would come to the market. The marketplace would correct itself. And we watched that market very carefully, hoping that the marketplace would correct itself and it hasn't. Mm -hmm. And so we had a bunch of, philanthropic individuals come to us and said, can you make insulin? And we said, we can, that we did look at it. We know how much it costs to bring it to the market. And they said, we'll, we'll raise the money to make it happen. Wow. So Dan Lilliquist led that initiative for us. And uh, we set a goal of $125 million in capital to be raised to bring the three different insulins to the market. And those three insulins would be the generics of Lantus, Umilog, and Novolog, mm -hmm. which is about 80% of the insulin used in the United States. So right. that's why we picked those three. And they were off patent, which is important. Yeah. And uh, we're on well on the way. We've raised over two thirds of that $125 million to bring those three molecules to the market. And I'm pretty sure by the end of the summer, we'll have all of that money. Wow. Uh when you said you thought that the market would correct on insulin and it never did, do you have an idea about why or a guess? Yeah, I'm pretty confident I know why. And it's uh, these perverse incentives that creeped into the market. So the higher the someone raises the price on insulin mm -hmm. and gives giant rebates to a pharmacy benefit managers, these are middlemen between the pharmaceutical company and the patient and they're negotiating contracts for insurance companies in large employers and they develop these formularies so if you go into the pharmacy there's a formulary and depending on who the insurance company is that drug that's higher on the formulary has a higher probability of being dispensed so you have three insulins out there they're very similar in the way they work and so the, what they want to do is to be very high on that formulary. They want to be the first choice. So what they do is they raise their price and provide big rebates to the pharmacy benefits managers who then put them higher in the formulary than anybody else. Now you have three players in the marketplace that are competing by seeing who can give the biggest rebate. And so it's estimated that probably 80% of the list price of insulin is a rebate. It's rebated to the PBMs. So if you look at that means $100, if the 
If uh, Lilly raises, they cost $100 for a vial of Lilly insulin. That means $80 is to be given to pharmacy benefit managers. And so they put you higher on the list. So they put you higher on the list. Now, what happens is for those who have no insurance, mm -hmm. right? they pay that list price. An insurance company negotiated a lower price through that pharmacy benefit manager. Mm -hmm. So an insurance company is paying the $20 per hundred dollars spent, right? So the person with no insurance or have big deductibles in their insurance plan, pay that list price until they can get something, you know, till they meet their deductible or they pay it the entire year. Okay. So what that says is the sickest people in society pay the highest price for their medications. Mm -hmm. And, and that seems the per, that's the perverse way of what insurance is supposed to do, right? right. Insurance right. is supposed to say the healthy of us <laughs> take care of the sickest. Right. But because these perverse incentives have creeped into the system, um, it's broken the insulin market, and, and it's and it's not going to get fixed easily. How how did if you know how did pharmacy benefits managers wiggle their way into this system? Was it through yeah. large employers? I, I honestly don't know the history of how that all started. Okay. Yeah. So it, this it's kind of crazy because it's almost like it's a little like three card Monty when you're talking about it. So, um, so the insurance company is, are they paying more? Like who's paying for this? Because if, if the people who are insured, I mean, they're, I, I pay, I don't know what I pay. I gotta be honest with you. $20, $40 when my daughter gets insulin. I don't think it's much. I think my healthcare probably costs, I, I hate to think about it, but I have recently, you know, I have a family of four. Um, we might be around eight, $9,000 a year. Like when, you know, what comes out of the check, what's out of pocket, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I mean, after that, who's, who's paying for this? Uh, so the way the system's set up, the benefit never reaches the patient, right? Okay. So you would assume that if there's rebates being paid to pharmacy benefit managers, that some of that rebate makes its way to the patient mm -hmm. and that doesn't happen. Okay. So pharmacy benefit managers are providing money to the insurance companies, to large employers, um, and it's being dispersed through the system, but the vast majority of that of that rebate stays with the pharmacy benefit manager. So these people are just passing money around to each other. That's right. Okay. What percentage of patients do you think aren't covered by insurance? Like who is really being hit by this numbers wise? Yeah, it's a good question. It's, it's, there's not a good statistic on that that I've been able to find, mm -hmm. but I hear enough horror stories Oh, sure. About people and the cost of their insulin that says that we'll be able to have a pretty significant market impact. Great. And remember, it's not just those without insurance. It's also those who have those high deductible plans. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, sure. Right, right? that you need, need to meet your deductible. And, and at the end of the day, if we can transform and disrupt this system, really, hopefully premiums can be lowered for people who have insurance. Why, why are they not fighting more about this or are they, are they just, see, you described earlier a scenario that made me think the, the way the NFL works, which is offenses develop something, then defensives f figure out how to get through it. And then the offense changes. Are they just changing their offense right now? Or are they letting you do this? Yeah. So I think they're, they're not taking us for granted because we have a proven track record that we can disrupt and transform. Mm -hmm. But it's part of our society is what have you done for me this quarter, right? I have to meet my quarterly objectives yeah. so my shareholders are rewarded. So they're not focused on something that's coming out in 2024. They're focused on what's coming out in May, August, right? Mm -hmm. So it's that short-term view of the world that I think, but I, I do see as we get closer to the launch of Civic Insulin, we will see a bunch of gnashing of teeth of those pharmacy benefit managers, but they also will shift the rebate game away from insulin, to some other product. Okay. Right? Just some so other vector is going to get hit by this. That's right. Yeah. So if you think about it, uh, the first big rebate drug 
that comes off patent will be Humira in 2023, mm -hmm. you know, used for arthritis and psoriasis and so forth. That's the first big drug that pays a lot of rebates. It's going to come and get generic competition. Mm -hmm. And we'll watch what happens in 2023. Will the generic companies play the rebate game to try to get better preference on the list? Or will the generic company, one generic company say, I'm going to try to break the system. So we're going to watch that closely. Okay. Uh, my Viatris or Myelin slash now Viatris, you now they have a uh, generic insulin called Sem Semgly, mm -hmm. right? And when they introduced it, they tried to break the marketplace with a low price, but they then had two versions of the same product. One that played the rebate game and one that just has a low price. Okay. And they're trying to serve two different marketplaces with that. Will that work? Because that's always what I've wondered. I've always wondered why the big companies don't just... I mean, from my, I have a bit of a hippie attitude, you know, and I always just thought like, well, make the money the way you're making the money off the insured people and everybody else, just give it to them. Like, who cares, right? Is that not viable? Well, they're not doing it. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, <laughs> well, I don't know that viable and palatable are the same thing, but, you know, I, I was, you know what I mean? Like, at some point, do you just... It's, well, it's a strange I, I, position to be to fair, take. all these companies have patient assistant programs, right? Yes. Where the really, really poor people have access to the medicine, mm -hmm. but it's more affecting, you know, the middle class, I would say, okay, right? who don't have the insurance or in between jobs, you know, things of that nature. Yeah. Yeah. How, how do you, so in this idea where you just kind of keep paying attention to drugs, like how many drugs are you manufacturing right now? So we offer 60 products to our members. We don't manufacture anything right now. Mm -hmm. We acquire them through other suppliers. So remember what I was saying, drugs are on shortage. That means people used to have a license to make something and they stop mm -hmm. or they're having difficulty making it. So we try to find alternate suppliers, bring them back into the marketplace for, by providing them a better economic model than what's currently in the system. And are you able to accomplish that because of the collection of hospitals that you're feeding? So you have enough need for them to go back into manufacturing? Right. So we guarantee them a certain market size and a certain market price for a five-year period. Okay. So they we've taken uncertainty out of the system for them, right? Know how much you're going to charge, how much they need to make over a five-year period. And the other thing we do that's different than the current system is we go to them and we say, you know what, we want to buy this product from you and we'll pay you the day you deliver the batch to us. Mm -hmm. Current system doesn't do that. Current system, you take it and put it into the wholesale network and the wholesaler pays you after they sell it. Yeah. So it could take you six, eight, 10 months, a year to be paid for a batch mm -hmm. where we pay you instantly. So we're changing the model. And we also then tell the supplier, you don't need to keep inventory. We keep all the inventory and we'll keep six months of the inventory. So there's always resiliency in our supply chain. So we won't have a shortage. When I was growing up, my buddy worked in a bookstore is a long time ago now, uh, over 30, oh geez, how old am I? It's over 30 years ago. <laughs> um, and you know, paperbacks would come out and they'd sell as many as they could. And when they were done and the, the interest was gone, if they had 10 books left, they'd return eight of them. But the way they got returned was they ripped the covers off of them, sent the covers back to prove that they hadn't sold them. And then the books were just destroyed. And I don't know what about what you just said made me think about that. But I think that most people who don't understand how this stuff works would be shocked to know that. Y you know what I mean? That, 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 um, so that you're paying up front is it got to be a huge comfort to them? And are you actually I, using the drugs? You're not, are you, or are you getting stuck with stuff that you are, you have books with covers ripped off from laying around? No, no, we, we've not had any product. We have 60 products we offer our members. Remember we have guaranteed business from our hospital systems, mm -hmm. right? We can forecast off of that. So we don't have product that expires because we know what the health systems needs are, what their buying patterns are. Yeah. And so we build our inventories to support that. That's amazing. It really is. Um, 
Now, insulin is going to be different, right? Yeah. Insulin is not going to be just given to our members. Mm-hmm. Insulin is going to be provided to anybody and everybody. Martin, you're good at this. Hold on. Let me just scratch off my next question from my little tick sheet in front of me that I was writing while you were talking. <laughs> my next question was, how do you get it outside of the system to the people? Go ahead. How are we doing that? <laughs> so, so we're going to give it to anybody and everybody. And, of course, we're going to have the help of diabetes advocates. Mm-hmm. So, you know, JDRH, right, beyond type 1. So these organizations that have raised money to support us to bring insulin to the market are going to be advocates for us and let their pay, their membership know where our insulin is available, how much it's going to cost, et cetera, et cetera. So they'll be advocates for us. We will provide that insulin to anybody who agrees to our pricing policy, right? And so our pricing policy is for a vial of insulin, it will not be more than $30. Mm-hmm. And we're going to communicate that through those advocacy organizations. We actually have a little QR code on our product labeling so so that you can read that QR code. You get the package insert, but more importantly, you know, there'll be a note that says you shouldn't pay more than $30 for this. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to give that information to the people with diabetes or their families, let them know that if you paid more than that, you know, you should find another pharmacy. Somebody's up charging you. Hey, yep. uh, just for clarity, you misspoke a second ago. You meant JDRF. JDRF, yeah. Yeah, yeah you said H. That that was. Oh, I'm H. sorry. No, don't be sorry. I just I I was like, is there someone I don't know about? And uh, so I wanted to double check. So so okay, so this has to go to pharmacies then. I mean, there's no other way to distribute it, right? Well, it's what you call your definition of a pharmacy, right? So clearly has to be dispensed by a pharmacy, Mm -hmm. but a pharmacy could be at Walmart or Costco or Amazon or a bunch of these new pharmacies that are being developed called digital pharmacies. Okay. Right. Right. So has to be dispensed by a pharmacy, but there are different kinds of pharmacies today than the brick and mortar ones on the corner. Mm -hmm. So this could be on, this may be online as well then. That's right. It could be online. And so you're, you're going to direct ship. From your st- from your stock, we it depends on how we're doing and who we're working with. But we could direct ship from our stock. I I don't think we'll be using wholesalers. Okay, yeah. This was um. I sat in a room once. I don't want to say with what company, and I kept saying, "Can't you guys just ship it directly? Like, why don't you get out of this model?" And uh, it, it seemed like something no one was interested in at the time. But it made sense to me in the moment, like listening to the wash of what they thought their problems were and their things to overcome. I was like, just sell it directly to people. Like start your own. Like I, I, I remember saying in that room, like start your own, just do it. I was like, you can pay yourself. I was like, it's kind of genius. No. And everybody was like, eh. I was like, all right. <laughs> so, so is, is the real thing here is that the way this is getting accomplished is through desire and that, and that somebody had to step outside of the system and, and want to do this because inside the game, no one person could make this change, right? Like you couldn't, if you would have stood up and had this idea at a big pharma company, everyone would have just turned their back on you and walked out of the room because like, ah, I need this job. I don't want to talk about this. Like right, right, that is the thing, right? It had to start over. Yeah, no, clearly it needed a disruptive, transformative and innovative approach mm-hmm. to be, to be successful. And and, you know, it, it takes startup companies to do that. You know, big pharma is traditionally very conservative. Right. And conservative organizations try not to be disruptive. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That That's what I see, too. I just, I mean, there was, because people are always saying, like, why don't you just, why don't you just? And I, I, I think to myself, like, if you were there, you'd know that's not possible. Like it's theoretically possible, but once you get into the system, you're not breaking free of that idea. I mean, you know, you know, in your regular job, good luck getting rid of the birthday cake they bring out on Friday for people. Like you, you couldn't, you couldn't get consensus on stopping that, you, you know? So uh, how are you going to get involved in this? Well, it's really kind of amazing. Um, how, how long ago was that meeting in Utah? Tell me again. So that meeting was, I want to say January 2017. Wow. 
So over five years ago. Yeah. Yeah. And so I just for people to understand like the the length of time that things like this take to happen. Um and, and because that person you met with, he had that idea prior to that even. So you're you're over five years of just thinking and planning and trying. And then the next step is I'm trying to imagine how you get startup money from people when you're not trying to profit. That seems like that might have been a daunting task as well, or no? So it it it, um, it wasn't that hard. Okay, but it wasn't. But it wasn't easy. Don't get me wrong; it wasn't easy, but it wasn't that hard. There was a there there was a giant problem uh, impacting patients' lives in hospitals, mm-hmm. but also it was driving inefficiencies and higher costs in the hospitals. So traditionally. What most hospitals have a drug shortage team Mm -hmm. consisting of pharmacists, supply chain, nurses, and even physicians. And they meet on a regular basis. And sometimes they meet even daily to say, what can we get today to treat the patients? And how are we going to have to do something different, a different procedure or buy a different drug? So now you have these people meeting every day. Mm -hmm. They're coming up with alternative ways of treating a patient, which means you got to train people in the hospital. And then you maybe have to buy more expensive drugs than the ones that were on shortage. It is estimated by like, you know, the government accounting office, uh, Vizient, which is a large group purchasing organization, that that's somewhere between 600 million and a billion dollars annually that's added costs in the health system. Wow. So you have that pain and suffering that's going through the health system, patient care and financially, and you want to solve this problem, right? Hmm. So you have a big problem that wants to be solved. And we ask you for some startup capital to go do it. Right. And it's not a hard sell. Okay. Right. So we very quickly brought in about one third of the hospitals in the country into our membership group. Mm -hmm. Now, when we just go and talk about insulin, that's another type of different kind of thing. The pain and suffering that diabetics deal with every day with the high price of insulin, rationing their insulin, not taking their insulin, right? Leading to really bad consequences for for them for doing that over the long term. There are a lot of people who are um, wealthy that want to change that that paradigm and they and they gave us money. You talked about the length of time. You know, we're building our own manufacturing plant in Virginia. And that plant was originally designed to make these drugs that are on drug shortage. Mm-hmm. That that process from the time you say, let's go and do it, to the time you're completed is about five years. Yeah. Right? Yeah, it's a it's a long haul. It really is. Uh, do you think other? Well, I I have a question before that question. When you're talking about the philanth the philanthropist, why did that word just come out of my people who want to help you? I'm not going to sit here and try to say <laughs> say that word that won't come out of my mouth for some reason that I clearly know. Um, when you when you're trying to get money from those people, um, and it and it's coming in. Do you think it? Does it need to keep coming or once you're up and running, you'll be okay? So our, our entire business model, both on the drug shortage side mm-hmm. and on the insulin side is once we're up and running with any particular product, that product has to be self-sustaining. Okay. So we have to charge enough for an individual product that it's self-sustaining. So we operate on a cost plus basis. What does it cost us to make a particular product? Let's add a little bit of margin to that so the product is self-sustaining. Mm-hmm. Okay, that, well, that's amazing. So the and these donors are not expecting any return on their money at all, or they are. They are not. No. Okay. Wow, I didn't know if that was part of your business model, where eventually the money comes, even just their initial money comes back to them or not. Do you think? Do you think that this is something that you can scale to keep impacting things? Or do you imagine other companies might start up like you and do similar things in other spaces? So clearly there's, there's enough 
things that need to be corrected in the in the marketplace that there's room for lots of competition yeah and we don't view it as competition right because our whole goal is not how much market share we get that's not our goal mm-hmm. it's how much market impact we make right do we fix the market but there are other nonprofits starting up that are trying to do th- similar things in other pieces of the of the area you have other organizations that are for profit that want to break the system and do things differently all those digital pharmacies yeah. they're trying to break the system mm-hmm. you have amazon they're trying to break the system right so you have lots of lots of people trying to do things different in this marketplace to try to change it do you think if the system was successfully broken down would that drive the major players out of the insulin game or other drug companies from making drugs I don't think people would leave the market, um, especially the insulin market. You know, Lilly and Nova and Sanofi, right, are heavily invested in insulin. Mm-hmm. And they're they're always working on how to make improvements. Yeah. So I just read yesterday that l- one of Lilly's drugs that lowers blood sugar causes weight loss, and just like Nova's drug does. And so they're looking at taking the, uh, a product that lowers your sugar levels to drive weight loss, mm-hmm. right? So they're always working on something in the space. They're always figuring out how to make improvements. And like I say, they're used to generic competition. They've, right, since 1984, the Hatch-Waxman Act has encouraged generic competition. And so they're used to it and they're always trying to innovate. So if their product goes off patent, they have something to replace it. You didn't get any pushback politically for this? Oh no, everybody. The entire political spectrum basically loves us. Okay. I mean, it's, it's, it's a bipartisan issue, right? Patients are Republicans, independents, and Democrats. They all hear the pain the patients have gone through. Every time I go to Washington, it's amazing. Every time I sit with a congressman or a senator or their staffers, how, how, how positive they are about us. They're encouraging us to be successful. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, no, it's it's very positive from Washington. Now, I know others are lobbying against us. Sure. But every every time I go sit with the senator or congressman, they they basically say, when are you going to do insulin? When -hmm. are you going to do insulin? That was from day one. When are you going to do insulin? Do you find that what they're saying in the room is reflected in their actions in public? You know, in public, they can't agree on anything, right? Right. I mean, they they wouldn't even be able to agree that Washington's birthday should remain a holiday or not, right? (laughs) So, so, so to me, you know, what they do publicly is, you know, is is very is very partisan. Yeah. And this this issue, you know, at least insulin, they're talking about a thirty five dollar cap on insulin. Mm And that actually is very complementary to what we're doing. Okay. Right? Because if you do a $35 cap, the pharma companies are still going to charge the price they charge. They're still going to give rebates to pharmacy benefits managers. So someone has to backstop what the current price is mm-hmm. to the $35 cap. Yeah. Okay. Right. So whoever is paying that backstop, if it's the government and we're charging $30, they benefit from what we're doing, mm-hmm. right? If it's an insurance company, they're benefiting from that backstop. And by the way, that that thirty five dollar cap only affects someone's copay. Okay, right. So if you're uninsured, that doesn't help you. Yeah. That thirty five dollar backstop. Right. Well, you know, it's it it's just it's almost it's angering. It, it is for me. It's angering to think that this entire problem is built off of people just. L- basically lining pockets to stay higher on a list so they can sell their thing. And at the same time, I actually understand how they fell into it. Like once it was there, I understand why they played the game, y- you know, where they wouldn't think, be selling. And, it and, I, and I think the game started with EpiPens. Really? That's where someone was smart enough to figure out, okay, generic competition's coming for my EpiPen. I charge right now, Three hundred dollars for two Epi pens. What I'm going to do is I'm going. And when I was charging three hundred dollars for two Epi pens, I was keeping two hundred and sixty dollars, and the pharmacy benefit manager was getting forty. Okay. 
I'm going to raise my price. I'm going to double my price. I'm going to double it to $600. And I'm going to give $300 to the pharmacy benefit manager to keep me at the top of the list and not put the generic guys anywhere on the list at all. Mm -hmm. And I now, now I don't keep $260. I keep $300. Mm -hmm. And the pharmacy benefit managers, they don't get $40. They get $300. So now I want to bring a low cost EpiPen to the market. Mm -hmm. I have to go to those pharmacy benefit managers, right? I have to go through them for the, to get at the insurance companies to pay for me. And I said, I got generic EpiPen. I want to bring two EpiPens for $50 to the market. Mm -hmm. And they go, but you got to give me 300 to get on the list. Yeah. <laughs> well, I can't give you 300. I'm only charging 50. It's like trying <laughs> to get know? into a club in the eighties. <laughs> you know, right. You're just, you're greasing palms at the door to get in. Um, I, I, I have two questions here. So my first one is, and I just want to kind of come from this, from the other angle for a second. Is there, how do I mean this? Making a drug is not easy. You're obviously a bright person, right? And and you have a lifetime worth of experience. And I think that as a as a lay person, I want bright people with lifetimes worth of experiences making drugs. Is there a, is there a world where you break the system so much that a kid coming out of college won't choose pharma? And do we weaken the system that way? I know that's a real big picture idea, but I was wondering if you ever thought about it. I mean, well, we think about it from a different perspective. Okay. So we say we do not want 100% of the volume for any drug, mm -hmm. right? Because if we do that, eventually we'll become the problem that we're trying to solve. I see. Right? Right. If we provide 100% of every drug and something goes wrong in our supply chain, we'll no longer be able to provide that drug. And that's not good. Right. So we we try to limit the amount of a drug that we produce to no more than 50% of the market. And we work with our members to kind of work through that, those calculations and those forecasts and those commitments we talked about. Mm -hmm. So we're trying not to do that from that perspective. Uh, could we break the market in such a way that no one would want to go into the into the pharmaceutical industry in the future. I think that's hard to do. I mean, one company could could hurt at another company, right? I could mm -hmm. take all the sales of insulin, for example, and and Sanofi and Lilly and Nova would be really financially hurt by that. But that's just three companies in an industry that has thousands of companies right. making pharmaceuticals. So I, I think it's hard for us to, do, to break the model so bad that people won't want to go into pharma. And, and Civica, as an example, are you compensating employees similarly to how they'd be compensated in, in a pharma? Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I'm the only one that makes nothing at the company. Somebody's walking otherwise, around. <laughs> otherwise, we pay very competitive salaries. <laughs> or, or I would not have been able to hire the team of people that I have. Yeah, right? yeah. I, get, I get that. It's just, it's a, you know, in my mind, the, those people, they go to expensive colleges and they come out and they have, you know what I mean? They're still people and they still have dreams and they want to yep. put kids through college, et cetera. But I think what we're really hearing is that some people at Civica are walking around with Martin's money in their pockets. <laughs> <laughs> it's a well, really, <laughs> it's a really kind thing you're doing. I have a couple more questions and I'm gonna let you go. Um, have you ever considered open sourcing what you're doing, going to other companies and sharing what's working and what's not working so it can grow? We, um, we are a very transparent organization and we, we actively teach our model to anybody who wants to learn it. And so not only companies, but I've had foreign governments call me and say, how did you do this? What are you doing? What can we learn from it? So we're very transparent and we do teach the model to people. It's wonderful. That really is. Okay. Well, we have painted a, a really rosy picture of, of insulin pricing in the future for people who, I mean, you imagine mostly this is going to be people who don't have insurance, right? That this is going to help. Well, so it'll definitely help those people, people with high deductibles, right? But also, right. It'll help insurance companies mm -hmm. 
right? Because insurance companies are paying a higher price than, than we'll be selling it for. So to help insurance companies and hopefully the insurance companies then lower their premiums based on those savings. Mm -hmm. And I guess if I just want to stick it to the man, I could buy your insulin if I wanted to, right? Well, clearly, I mean, think about it, right? I go to buy some generic drugs for myself, right? I'm an old guy. I have hypertension and high cholesterol and things, <laughs> bad knees. And so you take, take all your medicine. And so I know the cost of generic drugs and what it is. Mm -hmm. And I'll go to a pharmacy and my insurance deductible might be ten dollars fifteen dollars right right and i go and pay cash and i pay seven dollars yeah or sometimes some of the generic drugs that i had to take there was one example where i went to the pharmacy and they wanted to charge 250 dollars for the drug mm -hmm. right and my insurance company that was my deductible with the insurance company 250 dollars. yeah and i went on good rx and I found out if I go next door to the pharmacy next door, it'd be $25. Wow. Right. Yeah. So clearly there's games going on in the, in the insurance space too, that uh, people should be aware of tools like good RX and things like that to get that information to have the power. So you, you might not, I don't know if you'll be comfortable commenting on this, but I'm just asking a question. So there are, for-profit people who are still delivering drugs at more affordable and really affordable prices, their people are still being well compensated. We're talking about like obscene wealth at the top of organizations, right? Like I don't have a Maserati. I have seven Maseratis and so does my wife and my girlfriend, like that kind of thing. Like, right. It's just, it's a piling of money at some point. Am I right about that? Well, CEOs in all industries are highly compensated. Yeah. But that doesn't, that has very little to do with the price, right? Because you could deduct, you could say that person gets no money. It's not going to significantly lower the price of any of the medications, mm -hmm. right? Because one, people are trying to maximize the, for a for-profit company is designed to create shareholder value, Yeah. right? So the way you create shareholder value is either you increase your sales, increase your price or cut your costs. Right. Mm -hmm. There's no other way to create that shareholder value. And that's that's what people are supposed to do in a for profit space. Right. I had a, a person come to me once and with this idea and they said, well, why don't they just stop marketing it? They put so much money into marketing. And I said, uh, you're going to fire the marketing guy. I was like, he's 50. He's got two kids. One of them just went off to school. He's got diabetes. Now he can't afford his insurance. Like, And by the way, when they fire him, they're not going to take his $100,000 or two, whatever the hell he makes a year and split it up between all of us. And even if he did, do you need a quarter of a penny that badly? You, you know, like it's, it's a big, you really have to understand the space to impact it. It's so great that you were able to pull that group of people together. Are, are those other people... Um, as invested in like at Civica, I guess, is it, does the feeling I get from you, is it pervasive or, you know what I mean? Like sometimes people are just selling widgets, you know what I mean? So I would say clearly the, it, clearly the, the leadership team is, is invested, right? I mean, it's hard to get people to change jobs, right? Who are highly successful in their industry. Sure. And they change jobs because they believed in the mission and what we were doing. Right. And it's interesting that the rest of the organization, the number of people who come to us say, I want to work for you. I, I want to make that difference. Yeah. Right. And I can't make that difference where I'm working today. Mm -hmm. I'm right. like the cog in, in the, in the gears. Right. It's very interesting. My wife talks about that all the time that um, uh, she she felt she felt more fulfilled as a as the parent of somebody with diabetes when she worked at a company who just made diabetes stuff, you know, and not that she doesn't enjoy her job now, but that she there was extra for her. It's amazing. Uh, I and, guess it, and it is true. We out, after we made the announcement that we were going to do insulin, the number of people who wanted to come to work for us that had that diabetes connection, like you said, with your wife mm -hmm. was, was overwhelming and not just coming to work for us, a bunch of people who are at the end of their careers said, I'm going to retire. I'll come to work for you for free Wow, That's to amazing. do what I did. Right. Because of that diabetes connection. That's terrific. 
All right. Well, all right. I'm sold. Martin, when, when is this happening? So we'll deliver our first insulin. It will be the biosimilar of Lantus Glargy mm -hmm. in early 24. No kidding. You think first quarter or do you not say out loud what you think? <laughs> I always say out loud. What I think well, hey, I guess you're not publicly held. You can say whatever the heck you want. <laughs> but <That's right. laughs> um, we're really pushing for the first quarter of 24. Okay. Uh, it's going to be a tight schedule and a green light schedule to get there. But is, it, it will happen in 2024. Is the um, similar of Humalog or Novolog next? So everyone will have a little bit of a lag behind it. Mm -hmm. So, right, we've developed the first insulin. The Our partner who's making the active ingredient doesn't have, he, he then makes the first one that has a turnover and makes the second one and then a turnover and makes the third and repeats the process. So Glargine will be first. And then the other two will follow shortly thereafter you have in, a, in sequence. Do you have a timeline for those? or So all of those will be in 24. Oh, wow. It's about a quarter between each one to get the first ones to the market. Do you have, t do you have a, an amount of time you'll need to ramp and scale? Or will it happen pretty immediately? Um, well, when I say we're coming out in 24, we've built that ramp and scale into, into that the number. process. Oh, that's beautiful. Now, we anticipate that in our fourth year of operation, we'll have about one third of the market for those products. Hmm. And that's based on a forecast. Yeah. But, you know, forecasts are uh, wildly incorrect, right? They're not, they're not an accurate thing. So, sure. so we'll see it. It will all depend on how the marketplace responds. Right. Well, if you ever want to come back on here and let people know about it, I'd be thrilled to talk to you more. I think right. it's, it's a really wonderful uh, thing that you guys are doing. Um, am I not asking you anything that I should be? No, you asked all the right questions. Did I? Because I'm surprised by that, Martin. Because when we sat down, what <laughs> I knew was your name was Martin. <laughs> so I just went with the conversation. Uh, uh, good, good, so good. I mean I mean, you go through this. You have, you, you have an association with diabetes. You know what it's like. I have a question for you. Okay. So we hear from diabetics that they keep large quantities of insulin stored in their refrigerator for fear that there's going to be a shortage of insulin or they can't afford to pay for you know change companies whatever it is mm -hmm. uh I, I find that amazing that people feel the need to do that in our very you know well-to-do society right um do you, does your family do that? Do you keep large stocks of insulin? So I have, there. I think because, well, I'm going to have to, I, I think because of a job change that my wife experienced at some point, we got into a position where we had to send scripts to a new, through a new insurance company and we got insulin that we kind of didn't need. And so we had some left and then more came in and then since then, I've been able to maintain that backlog, I guess, as, as a lack of a better way to put it. Prior to that, I would have felt uncomfortable. It's funny. I would have felt uncomfortable under four vials. And my daughter probably uses, well, she uses 200 units every three days. So it's not a, I don't have that fear that you're talking about, but I have spoken to many, many people who have it. And I do generally... Uh, subscribe to what you said. There are literally four pharmacies within a mile of my house and I have insurance. And if I needed insulin, I could go get it. I'm not pressured by it, but I understand when people are, um, you know, I guess that's my answer. Yep. Good. It's yeah. really nice to meet you, Scott. You as well, Martin. This was, this was absolutely terrific. Uh, thank you. I, I, uh, I wish you all the best with this. Thank you again for what you're doing. All right. You ought to take a printer out of that place or a pack of paper or something. You know what I mean? One time, just be like, this is Martin's and just leave with it. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to see you compensated. <laughs> but thanks well, so I've, I've been very fortunate in my life, you know, from a fam having a great family and three great kids and, you know, working in great companies and, you know, I'm well to do and. You know, this didn't, it just didn't seem necessary to take a salary. It's really lovely. And there's no diabetes in your family. Is that right? No diabetes in my family. No kidding. Well, from all of us, uh, thank you very much. I really appreciate it.
All right. Yep. Take care. You too. Well, let me start off by thanking Martin for coming on the program. This was uh, an excellent conversation. I'd also like to thank the Contour Next One blood glucose meter and remind you to go to contournext.com forward slash juice box to get started today. And let's not forget U.S. Med. I wasn't going to forget them. I just, you know, it's a, it's a way to start talking. And let's not forget U.S. Med. White glove service. Always 90 days worth of supplies and fast free shipping. Get your free benefits check at usmed.com forward slash juice box or by calling 888-721-1514. I have to go get knee surgery tomorrow, so I'm going to keep this brief. If you're enjoying the podcast, please tell a friend, subscribe in a podcast app. Uh, That's pretty much it. Thank you so much for listening. I'll be back very soon with another episode of the Juice Box Podcast. It's a simple knee surgery. Please don't worry about me. I'll be fine.